What's up everybody, this is Barry Fishank and welcome to another episode of Aquarium Science. In this episode, we're going to discuss chemistry, which is the study of chemicals and trace elements in our aquariums. Chemistry is important to understand our aquarium water and inhabitants properly, and will learn us how to keep different animals better than ever before. In this video, we are going to cover some of the basic chemistry rules that we need for our aquariums to be successful and thriving. Do know that chemistry is very dangerous in some cases, and you have to be very careful by trying this at home. It can actually be harmful to your inhabitants if you don't do it right, especially if you are dosing chemicals. So let's start with salt water tanks. Salt water tanks need a proper salinity, which is pretty simple to read. We can measure it with something called specific gravity. We can measure this with a good old hydrometer. Your specific gravity should be anywhere from 1.021 to 1.025. Never higher, never lower. What is really important is that you never try to swing these salinity levels, especially if you have a reef tank or any sensitive saltwater inhabitants in your aquarium. Many invertebrates like snails, Starfish and urchins have a really hard time adapting to these new salinity levels so quickly, so you have to be sure that you don't swing them. So how do you secure this? Well, first of all, make sure that whenever you do a water change, which you might or might not do, that you put the same amount of salt in the mixture so that you won't swing the salinity levels under the water change. Also, when your tank is running normally and you got these really strong high lights on top of your reef tank, Water is going to evaporate, and this is going to release some of your H2O out of your aquarium and release it into the air. But, it will not release the salts, so they will stay, and when it's less concentrated and less levels of water, the salinity will rise. You can fix this by constantly filling your salt water tank up with RODI water manually, or you can use an auto top off system, which I still need. Other than salinity, there is also pH. pH is important in both freshwater and saltwater tanks, but in saltwater tanks, you want to keep the pH in what we in chemistry call basic. The basic pH starts at about 7.0, but that is simply way too low for a proper running saltwater tank, especially if you keep coral. So be sure to keep it at at least 8.1, but never higher than about 8.4. This is because they are used to such water in the wild, and quick changes in pH can be really dangerous, since it quickly can make a big change in hydrogen ions in the water. For example, at pH 8, there is about 10 times fewer hydrogen ions than at pH 7. Pretty crazy, right? But we are not done yet. There is also alkalinity, and alkalinity is also very important for successful reef aquariums. Alkalinity makes sure that there is enough calcium carbonate for corals to build their skeletal structures. When we measure alkalinity in our reef tanks, we will measure the amount of acid, hence hydrogen ions, that are in the water. And actually, this might sound quite complicated, but we test how far it is away from a pH of about 4.5, where bicarbonates is converted into carbonic acid. Now all of that weird stuff away, it will tell us how many amounts of hydrogen ions we need to reduce to pH to about 4.5. This way we will know the amount of bicarbonates that are present. So it's a measurement of bicarbonates, which again is what dominates all other ions that contribute to alkalinity. It's important to dose alkalinity, or change water with reef salt that contains alkalinity, because corals love alkalinity and they will just suck it out of the water much faster than you might think. Now to trace elements. We need high amounts of magnesium, calcium, and most often iodine and strontium, and in some cases, people also use boron and iron. But I would not even consider trying to dose iron or boron in a reef tank if you're a beginner, because it's quite a discussed topic and it's still not quite understood why it works and how it works, other than we know that iron contributes to major amounts of plant growth, which subsequently leads to phytoplankton growth, which is good, but we'll talk about that later. Boron is used to minorly increase your pH, but it has such a little benefit that most people prefer to not use it. Magnesium and calcium are important for coral structures, and they'll need them to thrive. Strontium and iodine, however, are more used for certain organisms like gastropods, cephalopods, and radiolaria, because they cannot survive without it. 
However, strontium is very dangerous to use without knowledge and proper testing because elevated concentrations of strontium is very toxic. Think about it, strontium is radioactive. But iodine is really dangerous to dose if you don't know your chemistry because of the fact that there are so many different natural forms of iodine and the test kits we use only detect a few of those forms present in the water therefore it won't give you the entire picture and because of that a lot of aquarists advise not to even try to dose iodine apart from your reef cell of course the recommended concentrations of magnesium is 1200 to 1400 ppm calcium levels should be between 380 and 450 ppm for strontium, most people suggest to keep it at around 5 to 15 ppm, but do not dose this without knowledge of the current levels in your tank. For iodine, I can't really give you any information, because as stated earlier, it's very hard to detect the accurate concentrations of it in the water. So let's go to freshwater tanks. Freshwater tanks are very different because we keep so many different types of freshwater tanks from African cichlids to planet tanks and even some cold water tanks. In African cichlid tanks it is usually recommended to keep the pH pretty high and basic but it's different for the lakes. Um, like Lake Malawi cichlid usually like pH is from about 7.7 .7 to 8.6 whereas cichlids from Lake Tanganyika prefers a range from about 7.3 to 8.0. This can be increased with salts, but be careful, these are still freshwater fish and you don't want to dry them out. Calcium can also work, but still be careful with dosing, because most likely it's a lot more safe to use your normal tap water pH. If you're interested in the salt and calcium subject of African cichlids, you can check out some of my earlier African cichlid episodes. However, what is a lot different from these types of tanks are planet tanks. Most planet tanks prefer acidic water, which means low pH, especially if you got fish from either parts of Asia, Southern Europe or South America. Fish like the Geophagus algifrons prefers a very low pH, below the 7.0 basic level, so it should be kept at about 4.8 to 6.6. .6. This goes the same for most South American fish species, even others from the South American cichlid genus like angelfish and discus. Most plants are from these regions too, and acidic water levels are actually a lot better for plants. However, plants are more tolerant to pH swings than most other organisms. Studies have actually shown that slightly acidic pH allows plants to absorb ammonium, which is produced by the inhabitants of your aquarium, which else only would be nitrites, and nitrates and phosphates which would be used. As for good plant growth material, iron is a really good one and in some cases it will also give your plants vibrant colors. I personally suggest to dose iron in your plant tank because it will give your plants incredibly strong roots and plant growth, as well as fast and healthy growth. Potassium also works for good root growth. Now, to one of the most discussed planet tank subjects, CO2. Is CO2 really needed? Short answer, no. Oh well, yes, but it's more advanced than that. A lot of people give people the wrong advice with CO2 and say that it is a must, but this is not necessarily true. I've actually made a long term experiment with this subject. Back in the days I had a 30 gallon planet tank with a fully running CO2 system. Did I notice better growth? Yes. Did I notice, notice like better color? Well yes, but it's not really that big of a deal. Don't get me wrong, some plants do need CO2, like baby tears for example, but here's the thing, if you think that all plants need added CO2 to thrive, you are wrong. Plants can thrive without adding CO2 and there are some few ways to keep it naturally balanced by strong water flow and surface agitation to in some cases dosing liquid carbon. Actually most plants can thrive without CO2 being added to the tank and I can prove it myself and many others can too. I've had healthy, colorful and strong growth without CO2 and many others have too. So don't think you need it. But the fact is that it will improve your growth. This is a huge misunderstood topic in the hobby. Plants indeed do need CO2 for photosynthesis, but photosynthesis will be completed for most plants by the amount of CO2 the fish releases into the water, and the amount of CO2 that gets in from the surface. And a little neat fact for you guys, warmer water contains more CO2, and acidic water is also a little bit more CO2 rich. So there you go, your plant tank will be fine. 
But without CO2, it is best to dose iron and other beneficial nutrients to make sure that your plants receive as much of this photosynthetic process as possible. Now for both salt water and fresh water tanks, there is temperature. Temperature is very important and it depends a lot on which tanks you have. For freshwater tropical tanks, it's best to keep the temperature at 25 to 27 degrees Celsius, whereas for saltwater tanks, it should be at a stable 24 to 26 degrees Celsius with no quick temperature changes. So let me explain why. In a lake, pond or river, there will be rainy seasons and this will deliver lots of new fresh and cold water, so the temperature often really swings in these habitats, also due to summer and winter seasons. The fish are used to it, but only to a certain degree, depending on where the species comes from. In a nutshell, I can give you an example. About 100 meters away from my house, there's located a large lake. This is a Danish lake, so it is cold water. But actually, at winter, it will be down to freezing temperatures, where the top of the water will be covered in ice, and where lower parts of the lake will be down to almost 4 degrees Celsius. But on a hot summer day, the lake might be up to around 24 degrees Celsius, which is still pretty high considering that it's a cold water lake. But when we look at our saltwater tanks, it's much different. For our exotic and warm water saltwater tanks, the temperature should not swing at all. In fact, if it does, it will kill almost all of your inhabitants. This is why it's best to keep your fish room at a good stable temperature level and also why it's best to put the same temperature water into the tank when you're changing, for example, evaporated water or even just some regular water changes. The reason for this is because the oceans never really change the temperature in the south regions of the world. However, at the North Sea between Norway and England, this is a different story, because in some areas it might change a lot, but the fish has adapted to that, and that is usually not the fish we keep. I wish it was, but no. Except for the North Sea scenario, where I was working for a few months ago. You can go check out those videos by clicking on the videos in the right and left corner. So, these are the basic rules of chemistry, and there's a lot more to it. If you want me to cover more of it, let me know. So that was this episode of Aquarium Science. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and thanks for the amazing support and response in this series. I'm working really hard on editing these videos, so I'm happy to see that it gets received nicely by my viewers. Thank you guys for watching, and see you guys in another video.